Excuse us just a moment. Excuse us. This is the temple of praise. Now, we don't do things like everybody else do. You know how some churches have church programs and they, they follow suit with the church program. You notice we don't have church programs. And, and one of the reasons we don't have church programs is because anything could happen at any time. And, and we don't want to put God on the program. We, we won't let him have his way. So we have here today a young lady who won't join right now. This young lady, her name is Sunia, and she's come to join in part of this ministry. Not only that, uh, what I want to do seeing how that she opened the doors of the church uh, there might be somebody else in here who want to join right now amen let's, let's if you don't mind just kind of stand to your feet so you can be on the same accord might be somebody else come on come on might be somebody else might be somebody might be somebody else might be somebody else might be somebody else Oftentimes, you know, we, we are so attached to certain methods and the way certain things go. It, it goes somebody else. Some, somebody asked me, they, they asked me the question they once. They said, Bishop, uh, a lot of young people or millennials join your church. I said, well, they, they, they said, what's the secret? I said, there's no secret. It's just Jesus. Here comes somebody else. Might be somebody else. My brother, my just, sister, just in case you forgot, the reason we have church is so the people can be educated and evangelized and saved. That's why we come to church. So we know how to win the world for, for Jesus Christ. That, that's what it's about. There might be somebody else that want to change your whole life. You want to turn some things around. He's gonna take good care of you. God bless you. You can rise it. Take those that have come. Somebody help me glorify God for what He's done. God's got a blessing. Bless His holy name. I, I want you to go me to the book of Romans and for those of you that made your way out to the convocation you have to agree with me that God truly blessed us absolutely Bishop Owens Bishop Peebles the Lord really blessed us tremendously we are praying about and uh, uh, talking and we'll be talking to Bishop Peoples about us coming together and having a conference I believe that that's going to be world-changing 
I notice the intensity of the praise when the two churches came together it was powerful and to hear a portion of his story I heard much more than he said but we're going to get him to come back just to testify and talk about what that whole experience was like as you know we had been in prayer with them knowing that um, God had his hands on him Romans 12 I read from the King James first and then I'll go to the NIV Romans 12 11 says not slowful in business fervent in spirit serving the Lord the NIV says never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Amen. I want to talk to you basically this morning about keeping your enthusiasm. You, you may be seated. Keeping, keeping your enthusiasm. I've, I've had opportunities. I'm, I'm so thankful. And I remember when I first started preaching, I would oftentimes preach from the Word of God. Uh, I didn't have a lot of experiences to couple or to attach to the Word. Being a young preacher, I was 29 when I first started to preach, and I was about 33 when I first started pastoring. And a uh, young man, and had a lot of studying to do, and I studied and I prayed and I studied and I prayed just to deliver and or to teach whatever my assignment was when people called me to participate in the gospel ministry. I have a tendency somehow or another, I would preach and preach and talk about different things, and. I never will forget when uh, uh, Sir Staples passed and I preached at her funeral, I did not know the pain that people felt because I hadn't felt that pain. I remember getting up and I apologized to the congregation because oftentimes I would preach and I didn't understand what folk went through. Many times we as preachers, and we, we are called by God, we're answer the call. And while we're answering the call, good to see you, Deacon Beasley. While we're answering the call, we have a tendency somehow or another to uh, get to the place in answering the call that uh, uh, we fall short with, when it comes to experiences. We, 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 we fall short. And uh, when we start going through stuff, we find out somehow or another that we're standing up here preaching to people from the word of God. Now you are, you haven't experienced any death and you married and you got two kids. And you got a house with a white picket fence around it. And you're living a good, strong, middle-class life when other folk that you're preaching to are not married. And they're struggling with their sexuality and, and with lust and things of that nature. And you stand up here telling them what they're doing wrong. When all you got to do when you get home is roll over. But you're going to criticize somebody else that don't have that particular gifting or that ability or whatever it might be. And we will sit and talk about that. We'll talk about folk not doing this and people not doing this and people not doing that. And they need to do this. And many times we have no experience. Many times young preachers preach without experience. But that's okay because... Uh, God will give you something to preach about. He'll let you walk through it. He'll let you feel it. He'll let you mess up. He'll make you fall on your knees. He'll make you cry out to God. 
and you'll feel about this big coming to the pulpit. Not as though you're coming to somehow another display your gifts and to display your talents and display your anointing. Because let me share something with you. Sometimes you can come to a church such as this church, which is anointed by itself. You have, sometimes you have more anointed in the pew than you have in the pulpit. See what this, this is what, but see when you come to a ministry like this that's been through what we've been through, uh, it's not your anointing that can set the church on fire. It's the anointing in the pews. See, and we've learned how to help you preach. Because we know you're just getting started. We don't want you to fail. So we don't sit down on you and, you know, down in the country, you could almost, you could all, almost tell when you're kind of losing ground while you're preaching and uh, one of them old mothers in the church will, will shout at you and tell you something and they'll be praying for you while they'll be telling you to go head on, you know, uh, all of those particular coded messages telling you to keep on preaching and don't give up and don't, you know, don't quit, but just keep on because they're, they're, sometimes a go-ahead preacher or a preach preacher is a cold. Yes, <laughs> and it's not that easy, not that difficult to discern because if they tell you to preach preacher, maybe you ain't preaching. <laughs> but then you begin to have experiences where you don't need nobody to tell you to preach. You don't need anyone to push you because you're standing on ground that's unshakable. But during, during that time, during the situations where you're going through stuff, you have to see, uh, you have to learn how to maintain a certain presentation as a minister. I, I want you to understand this because you preach while you're walking. You preach in your good morning because people need to know that uh, there is a God and no matter what goes on, there is a God and that God will take care of them. So you have to, it's not being fake. It's, it's being confident in your tomorrow. Today I might not feel well, but you should not know as an ordained minister is how you sit in church. It's how you wave your hand. You see, because it's not happenstance. It's not that something happens to you. And then you wear it as if to say, I'm so weak and I'm so immature that I need you. You're the preacher. You said God called you, but your presentation makes me think you're lying. Because if God called you, no matter what I'm going through, you should not see my grief or my pain. I only share that with those that can handle it. Because see, me preaching says one thing. I'm preaching because I believe that it won't be like this always. Not just for you, but for me too. Because I'm the first line of defense. I got to tell somebody, no matter what goes on in my life, that God will make a way somehow. I got to shout first. I got to dance first. I got to hallelujah first. Unless I'm lying about what I say Come on, be seated, please. The word enthusiasm comes from the Latin word, also the Greek word, it's a symbol. The Latin word, entheos. Theos, theology, 
Theology, theos means God. In means in. In theos, in God. I have to maintain. It is not something that is just on me because I'm Pastor Staples. It's not just something that just resides with me because I'm Bishop Staples and I'm this and I'm that and all this stuff. It, it, it's not just automatic. I'll have to work on it. See, see, one of the things that you as preachers and those that are listening to me and those that are watching by web, one thing that preachers have to do, the work of the preacher, 90% of it is on you. So that when, see, see, when I come to the house of God, because God is in me, I have to understand, I have to come with hope. Nobody sitting in that audience need to look in the pulpit and see despair. Or you are turn your license in. How you gonna preach when you can't even sit with hope? You can't sit like everything gonna be all right. You can't pray. This is the opportunity for you to smack the devil upside the head. And although I had a bad day yesterday, I'm gonna give God praise today because my situation would never be like this always. It won't be like this. If you don't believe your situation is not going to be great after a while, how are you gonna tell me? So when I hear Bishop going to let you preach, why must I come to church? When I know you're scheduled to preach and you're sitting up here like the world coming to an end, I don't want to hear that. If you sit like the world going to come to an end, what you going to say when you stand right here? And it's not, it's not, come on, be seated, please. It's not, it's not that you're coming here and because you're saved and you got the Holy Ghost, that all of a sudden something's just going to fall and drape on you. Joy just, whew. glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. And then, you know, while you, you, the Spirit of God just going to make you have joy for about 35 minutes. You have to have enthusiasm, which means that I have God within. Psalms 62. Y'all ready for this? See, the thing about it is I'm responsible for you all. See, see, when I stand before God, I stand for myself, and then I stand for what I've done with my call. I, I want there to be a section in heaven who's come to Christ and lived this life adequately and successfully because of the ministry God gave me. I, I want you to understand you have the same responsibility. Psalm 62, 5 says, my soul, that's a part of me that's saved, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Now, now you, you, you have to understand that the, the reason I know everything going to be all right in my life. It's because my expectation is from him, not from stuff that I do, not from stuff that I got planned, not from stuff that I, see, because God can take your plans and dash them up against a rock. Unless you forgot, the Bible says uh, that he has plans for, he has plans for us. You might as well take your plans and tear them up because he's got plans for you. As a matter of fact, he knows what's going to happen to you today. He 
He knows who you're going to meet, who you're going to talk to, who you're going to deal with, who you're going to have lunch or dinner with, the conversation. He, God knows now exactly what time you're going to go to sleep. So you need to do like the old folks say, Lord, Lord, have your way. My expectation is from him. Turn, turn to somebody and say, uh, 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 where is your expectation coming from? Or do you have some plans? See, you, you, can't, you, can't, you, you can't just uh, uh, materialize joy. You have to work on joy. You got to get up in the morning and use your words and your mouth. Because over here you might have a bad thing going on. But over here something's good that's happening. And you got to say something about what's good that's happening in your life. God bless me. My children are fine. I paid my bills. I might have to bury my uncle today. But I got, the, I got this and I got that. And I get through that process over here. But God's going to bless me because he's God. Come on, let me see. And I'm not trying to negate the fact that some of us are going through difficult times. I'm not trying to do that. You're going to do that, you know. If anybody knows about difficult times, it's me. I know how to do this and bury mama two weeks ago. I know how. See, and it's not so much that I'm strong. It's just, it's just that I keep putting one foot in front of the other one. That's, that's all. That's all. If, if I can get up and walk downstairs, I can get up and walk to the church. I may not want to be around a whole lot of folk because of what I'm going through, but because I'm called. Don't, see, see, difficult times develop your anointing. While other folk getting up trying to, you know, uh, stir up an anointing, you ain't got to do that. Because it was the anointing that brought you through. So when you stand up and open up your mouth, stuff going to fall in place. Because the anointing of the living God is what you depended on. When you buried somebody, when you got sick, when you, you had problems in your marriage and with your children, all of that stuff, the anointing was what the, was, was the thing that brought you through. So you ain't got to come up here and try to conjure up no anointing when you woke up this morning. He was all over you. Secondly, Realize that God is your salvation, your glory, the rock of your strength. He's your refuge. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before God. Tell him about it. I must tell Jesus. Tell him about it. All of my troubles. I must tell him. Secondly, realize that you can control your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your actions. You can control that. It might hit you, but when it hits you, stand still for a minute. Oh, old folk, you say count to ten. Try to settle down so you can get yourself together. It, it is not that you are out of control. You might be hurt, angry, mad, sad, but you can control your sad. You can control your mad. You can control yourself. Let's go to Romans. Eight. We going somewhere. 
Romans 8 and 6. Romans 8 and 6. For to be carnally minded is death. The word carnal means fleshly. Fleshly means that you're just operating particularly by what you think and what you feel. There are times many of us who are assigned to a particular work have to rebuke ourselves. We have to maintain that joy, that happiness. And I'm talking to those of us who are Christians. We have to maintain that those of us who are elevated in even higher positions, who are ministers or elders or pastors or bishops or archbishops or whatever folk call themselves nowadays, you have to, you, you, when, when you throw your title out there, you're throwing your, your level of control. When you say I'm Reverend so and so, that means you got some control. That means that you can you, you can you can handle some things. This, this this whole aspect of those of us who are spiritual waiting on the Holy Ghost to fall on us before we kill somebody. The Holy Ghost ain't gonna fall on you before you kill. You got to stop yourself. The Holy Ghost, unless you misinterpret his assignment, is to comfort you. That, that's why you can't never talk about how alone and lonely you are and say you have the Holy Ghost. You, you have to you know, when you feel a little lonely, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't go in the house and, and extend or emphasize the loneliness by putting on Luther Vandross. You're going to be shown up lonely when Luther get through talking to you. Call somebody on the phone talking about a chair is not a chair. A house is not a home. You, you're going to be real lonely after all of that. But, but, but you were the one who pushed the button. They, they got apps on your phone where you ain't even got to read the Bible. It'll read for itself. You can just put that out and you, and you hear somebody else reading through that. And, and if you do have the Spirit of God, by the time you, you, you get through listening to what the Scripture says about different things, all that stuff will evaporate from you. And the Lord will set you up real, I mean the devil will set you up real pretty. He'll set, he'll set you up. You lonely and you doing this and you died of that and you start putting on Luther and one of them old boyfriends are called just at the right time. You know the one you liked, you really liked. You liked in certain ways. You know the one you really liked in certain ways. will call you at the right time. And, and, you, and, you, and you find out that that behavior delays promises. Romans 15. I'm almost done. Romans 15 and 13.
15 and 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in, watch this, in believing. In believing. That you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. In other words, I have to believe that everything is going to be all right. So, sometimes when things happen to you, like I may mention of the example of how loneliness hits you and you be lonely, oftentimes the devil would do that to camouflage and to blind you from seeing that your breakthrough is coming. You didn't spend the evening being lonely, but that was the evening that was a sign for your breakthrough. Because you control yourself, you went into a different direction. Thirdly, realize that any state of mind is contagious. I don't care if it's joy, if it's sad, whatever. That, that, that's why when, when you are, when you're real, when you're saved, and one of your friends called you, you have to go in the press. Okay, to listen. Listen. Let them express what they need because you can't tell everybody what you're dealing with. Listen, but don't forget to pray. Because when things happen, we have the ability to change situations through prayer. Sometimes you just got to go old fashioned. Go, go, go old school. Go old school. Just, just go straight old school. Just, just, just if, if your child going through something, go old school. Get you some anointing oil and anoint the door. Anoint his pillow. Anoint the doorknob. Stretch out on the floor in his room. Leave the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost in his room. Speak in tongues, laying on his. So, sometimes you just got to go old school. Tell your neighbor you got to go old school sometimes. While you're in there washing the dishes and washing clothes and vacuuming, just open up your mouth and let tongues start flowing. It will work and be handled quicker than you worrying about something. Let me, let me carry to a close. Remember, remember, thirdly I said that uh, the state of mind is contagious. Uh, you have to be careful. Some of you who are ministers, if you're young in ministry, be careful who you try to counsel. Because you call yourself trying to counsel somebody and somebody have their eye on you. I counseled females in my office with the door cracked with somebody standing outside the door. See, you have to be cautious because it could be somebody, you know, that may like you, whether it's male or female. They might see a little something in you and tell you I want you to stop by the house and pray for me and it won't be nothing to do with prayer. And you, you've been preaching for a year and you think I can handle it but you can't handle it just because your trial sermon was off the chain. That don't mean that you're strong. It means you're talented and gifted. And some people 
they don't do it on purpose. It's the thing that's in them that comes after you to try to destroy you. You could be a rising star in ministry and before two years come, you didn't stop preaching and stop going to church because you think somebody's going to find out about your activities. <laughs> 